let's uh, let's go to First Thessalonians chapter four, and I'm going to read verses sixteen and seventeen, and I'm going to continue speaking about what we've been looking at the last uh, last couple of weeks about the uh, catching up, and we'll read that right in the verses here. Temperature outside. All right. Uh, uh, mute, mute these folks, Susan, please. Okay. Uh, let's look at verses 16 and 17 in 1 Thessalonians 4, where it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Now, we've been looking at this for a couple of weeks here uh, about the catching up in the air is what it's all about. And last week, just for a little review, if you weren't with us, uh, two things we needed to understand as we began the, the lesson last week. Number one was, how do we know that Christ is in us? How do we know that Christ is in us? Now, I gave you a few verses, so let's, uh, a couple verses. Let's go back to Galatians chapter number two uh, by way of review here. Galatians chapter number two and verse number 20, the familiar verse, we all know this verse, where it says, I have been crucified with Christ and is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So this is something that Paul taught, that Christ lives in me. And a life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith or the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now, this is one of those principles that a lot of Christians never grab onto, that we live by the faithfulness. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God, who, of course, you know, as the verse says, gave himself for me. Then I go over to chapter 3, please, and let's notice verses 23 and 24, where it says, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become a, our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by his faith. All right. We're justified because of the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ and his relationship with his father and what he accomplished for us uh, through his, throughout his you know, earthly life and, of course, the, cry, the, the cross work and the uh, resurrection, of course, then the ascension. So that's what we're talking about when we say uh, Christ is in us, all right? When we believe on Christ, and we'll explain that uh, uh, in just a moment. But how about the other side? How about us in Christ? Now, we talked and we went to back to John chapter 15. I am the vine, ye are the branches, brings the Father into it. You abide in me, abide in the Father, et cetera, et cetera. But let's go back to uh, 1 John, please, and chapter number 2. So what's it mean for us to abide in our Lord, all right, in the Lord Jesus Christ? <clears throat> let's see, John chapter 2. Let's notice, first of all, verses 5 and 6 here, all right? It says in verse 5, John, 1 John chapter 2, but whoever keeps his word. Now, let me change the word keeps. Say, well, brother, how can you do that? The literal Greek meaning is whoever treasures his word. It becomes something precious to you. All right. Whoever treasures his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. Now, Galatians 2.20, he's in us. But here now, John's writing saying we are also in him. OK, verse six, the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So if we're saying we abide in him, then what's it say? Uh, <laughs> and again, the, where it says ought here, as a personal debt, 
we should walk in the same manner as he walked because of what he's done for us, being in him, all right? And then we go over to chapter number three, same book, and notice verses 23 and 24, where it says, this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know this by uh, this, we know by this, that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given. So the literal rendering here is, let Christ be at home in us. And we know we are the temple of God now, don't we? You know, we, we've been through that. But not only that, that Christ is a home to us. So we are in him, he is in us. And that's very important to understand if we're going to understand what 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 are saying. So walk as Jesus walked. That's a Greek idiom that means do what Jesus did. He indeed is our pattern, okay? He is our pattern or our model. Um, and I have a lot of verses, but come back to John 14 with me, please. Now it goes, you know, if I go too fast, you just yell at me. Okay. John 14, verse 12 says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Now remember the idea that we just saw in, in 1 John chapter 2 and chapter number 3, that we walk after him and his model that he was to us, all right? The works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Now, this is going to be a separate message that we're going to do here down the line a little bit, okay? We, we, we can't stop because it's very, very involved. But a lot of times I hear, well, how can I do something greater than what the Lord Jesus Christ did? Well, the Bible shows us some things about it, and and you'll you know we'll we'll look at that at, at a future date. Okay, uh, I wanted to bring this up because I say to you, who he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and we're to walk following him. Okay, in these works, um, you know, in the last six months. Most of the time, I close the Sunday message with uh, have a great week in the realm of Jesus. And that's come to mean a lot to me. Now, I read that somewhere down the line, and I, you know, that was a year ago, and it just grabbed on to me. Walk in the realm of Jesus. In other words, where Jesus is. His realm of life is where we, we are to be. So what I want to do then is take you back to last week and review the five, uh, I call them the five steps uh, of being with Christ. And, and I, if you remember, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a couple minutes, but when we see the word air, it's A-E-R in the Greek. There's two words, if y'all remember that. Oranius and air, A-E-R. And the word that Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17 is the A-E-R. That is the air that you breathe, you expel. It's the air that surrounds you, okay? Uh, close to the earth, we, we would say. That's how Mouse, Mr. Mouse put it, Mounds, I should say, uh, in his lexicon. And uh, I read the other lexicons that define that words, wherein Oranius is what? That's where the birds fly above us. That's where the mountains are, where the air starts to get get thin, and, and where we, we head into outer space and, and that sort of thing. So First Thessalonians 4 is not talking about that. It's talking about something that happens right here on earth, because as I put it last week, or maybe the week before, is that we can be raptured up, caught up, 
with the Lord without our feet ever leaving the ground. And I believe that's what happened because I'm, I believe in fulfillment theology, okay? I'm not a futurist. That's what happened to the saints that were alive when the Lord came, all right? There in 68 AD, I believe that's when the second, we call it the second coming happened, okay? But let me, let me go through something with you here as a review, all right? Remember, we are co-crucified with Christ. And I'm not going to read the verses, but it's you have Romans 6, verses 5 and 6. And you also had Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 that we already read. Okay? So, uh, what we do, as Christ did, he voluntarily sacrificed himself for us on our behalf, we say. Okay? Now, us being co-crucified with him... And if you want to be a disciple, you know, we read these verses last week. What do you have to do? You have to pick up your cross and follow him. All right. Paul talks about in Galatians chapter six, I want to say verse 14 around there. I am crucified with Christ and the, and the world is crucified unto me. Okay, if you all, all remember that. So we're co-crucified with him. Then we saw that we were co-buried with him. I'm using the word co because... That's the idea here. When Christ went to the cross that, and died, that's what happened to us, according to Paul. Okay? So co-buried, you got Romans chapter 6, verse 4, and also Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Okay? So you're baptized into Christ. You're buried with him, see? Then number three was this. You're co-resurrected with Christ. That's Romans 6 again, verses 4 and 5. Colossians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, and Ephesians chapter 2, first five verses. So what we found is that we're born again to a new life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation or a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. In a couple minutes here, I'm going to I'm going to read to you from Jonathan Mitchell's uh, New Testament expanded New Testament that verse, and you're going to be surprised at, at what it says. Okay, but number four, then you're co-ascended with Christ. Ephesians two six, Colossians three one. You've gone up. Okay, in term in terms of the spiritual world there ascended so we're trusting him in other words uh to lead our lives we're obedient to his word it's a treasure to us remember all right a treasure to us and we're seeking the things that are above that's what uh colossians chapter 3 the first three verses are all about and what is above his kingdom his righteousness remember colossians 1 says we've already been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Then the fifth point that I tried to bring forth was this, we're co-seated with Christ. In other words, we sit in heavenly places uh, with Christ Jesus. We see Ephesians 2, 6 and 7. Uh, in fact, Ephesians 1, verses 18 to 23, Colossians 3 again, those first three verses, and Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10 show this. And not only that, we talked about Second Timothy chapter number two, verses 11 to 13, where Paul said, hey, this is a faithful saying. If we suffer with him, what do we do? We reign with him. Say, if we deny him, he denies us. Denies us what? A reign. Okay, but he can't deny us personally in our salvation because he's faithful. All right, he's faithful to us. So we brought forth those five things, uh, five steps. I call them steps. You want to call them steps. And we've seen those for years. And, and the whole matter here was that these five steps produce the fullness of the resurrection life within us if we grab on to them, get them into our hearts, get them into our minds, and they, became, they become part of what our life is. Now, we'd say walk in the spirit, whatever, whatever terminology uh, you want to get it. Uh, turn over to Philippians, and maybe this will explain it a little bit. 
Philippians chapter 1, please. Okay. Philippians chapter number 1. And let's notice we want to begin here, I think, verse 21. Yes, 21. I'll read down through about 26. Paul says, for me to live is what? Christ. Remember Galatians 2.20, the life I live, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. The dying here, well, we'll look at that. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard pressed. Now remember, where is Paul when he wrote this? He's in prison. He knows time is short, right? For his life. I do not know which to choose, uh, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and to be with Christ. He wants to be there where he's already seated, but he wants to be in his presence, right? For that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sakes. So convinced of this, he says, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in faith. So what does this tell us about Paul's attitude toward people, toward his, his attitude toward his life in Christ? He was a man of humility that looked at others. He says to die would be gain, but he says to live would be joy, but for you. So he had it in his heart that he was there for other people, is what I'm trying to say. In this case, other believers, all right? Then it says um, in verse 26, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. So their, their proud confidence in Paul was actually based on what? The Lord Jesus Christ, see? Until my coming to you again. By the way, the coming to you, to you again, the coming, the coming there is a prusia. That's the word that Paul uses for uh, the second coming, okay? So all five involve a deadly, or a, a, a deadly, I'm sorry, a identification and application in our lives. It's a matter of, have you ever gotten so familiar with something? Say a job, you're, you're trained in it, all right? And you become very proficient in it and you don't have to guess, well, this is part one, part two, part three, or step one, step two, step three, no. It was in your mind, it gets into your subconscious. So it's part of who you are when you go to your job every day, all right? Now, that's what we're looking at with these five steps. They have to be so ingrained into your heart and mind that they actually become part of what I call your subconscious. And you no longer have to think of them. And what we talked about last week, we're walking. Remember, if, if we're in him, why are we in him? Because we're walking as he walked. He is our model. And we don't have to force ourselves. We don't even think about the walk. It's just part of what we are, the realm of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now now watch this with me. I want to read out of John, Jonathan Mitchell here, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, okay, and verse 17. Now, now this is interesting as you read this. Now remember, Jonathan Mitchell expands because of the Greek language. Uh, it's, it's hard to take one Greek word and translate with one English word. In fact, um, I'll tell you a little story here. Um, last year, I don't know if it was for my birthday or, or what, my dear children, the, my four children, uh, thought it would be good for me to continue my education. So they sent me up, they signed me up to a online seminary. Seminary now it's called. And bless their hearts, they paid for it and in, in, in all that sort of thing, okay? And I did, I did some courses, I really enjoyed them. Uh, uh, two, of, two of the fellows that taught the courses, I, have, I had their books, all right? So I knew some of the people that were teaching, uh, the professors. And uh, 
what happened here is last week, my bank account, I saw there was a, uh, someone took out $176. <laughs> and here it was seminary now. And I was going to cancel it, but I, I, before I did that, I went on to see what they are offering for this year. And it was fabulous, some of the subjects. Okay, so here's what happened. So I, I, I just finished a course this afternoon uh, with, with a gentleman named John Watkins. Okay, it's called The Lost World of Genesis Number 1. And he brought up a couple things that I thought were just amazing. All right. And he says, you know, and now this is about Genesis chapter number one, and I would love to teach you that. I wish I could just put it on the internet so you could watch it with me. Uh, just, just tremendous. But he says there's, there's two rivers of interpretation in scripture. One river is flowing out of God. And it's a river that has to do with audience relevance about who he was wanted the audience to be and you know the whole scripture is based on 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 what audience relevance we have the nation of israel but not only israel the nations around the, the middle east nations and the greek nation okay so that's one river that we flow down to find in uh, proper interpretations of scripture the other river has been set forth by men's religion and what they think things should mean in terms of where they live, the time they live, and that sort of thing. And if you flow down that river, you're not always going to get a correct interpretation that God wanted. Okay? And there were other things that, that he brought up that, that were real interesting. But the reason I do that or said that is because, you know, as we read here in, in uh, Jonathan Mitchell's uh, New Testament here, and and I've I've recommended this many times. I don't know if anybody's got it. The New Testament, God's message of goodness, ease, and well-being, which brings God's gift of His Spirit, His life, His grace, His power, His fairness, His peace, and His love. Then it says expanded, amplified, multiple renderings. You know, and so it's a joy. What I'm trying to say, it's a joy to read. And, and to get a further understanding of what Paul was writing to us. So when I read verse number 17 here of chapter number 4, okay, make sure I'm at the right place, Dan. Okay. I almost was. I almost read chapter 5. All right. Here we go. Uh, chapter 4. Come on. Yeah, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. That's what I want. I'm, don't mind me. Okay. Been reading so much today. Chapter 5, here it is. And we want verse number 17. It says here, Consequently, since someone is within Christ. Okay, so Paul's talking about being where? In Christ. Okay, within Christ. And then he has in parentheses, So that if anyone is in union with the anointed one, or... And as since a certain one was in Christ, close parentheses. Now he continues with the verse. There is a new creation or a framing and founding of a different kind. He or she is an act of creation having a fresh character and a new quality. When you believed on Christ, that's what happened to you in the eyes of God. And he gave these thoughts to the writers of Scripture so we could begin to understand how God perceived this. We are new creations, okay? New creations. And I think that's it's interesting, having a fresh character and new quality. Then he goes on, the original things, the old man, you know, the original things, the beginning situations, the archaic, and the primitive arrangements. The beginning things. Here's one thing that Mr. and I wanted to share this with you, uh, Watkins said. He says, you have to remember this. When you're reading even the New Testament, you have to know when the books were written. Because God is progressive. 
And I'm going to show you that in 1 Thessalonians 4 was written before 1 Thessalonians, I mean, before 1 Corinthians 15. They both speak of a, we say a resurrection, right? They both speak of a resurrection. But neither of them tell you where you're going. Read it and see. Neither of them do. All right. It's not until we get to Ephesians and Colossians that we find out, hey, it's heavenly places. And I thought that was very, you know, to me, that was eye opening. Because what we're finding, even in, if you just take Paul's writings, his early writings, like, you know, we say most people think it's Galatians and the Thessalonians, all right, then the Corinthians, then he writes to the Romans, and then he's in prison, and he, and actually he writes uh, uh, Philippians first, and then Ephesians and Colossians, and find, you know, tunes with the, we call them the pastoral epistles, and you see progressions in those of, of belief, all right, that Paul writes about, in the old, you know, the newer books. So he's, he's teaching them, all right? Progressive revelation, I guess we would call that. So let me consider this. Okay, let me re keep reading. So the original things, in other words, the beginning, what you were before you were saved, say. In other words, they're the archaic things. They're primitive things, primitive arrangements in your life, okay? They're passed by now. They went to one side so the new could come in, right? Consider, he says, and he has an exclamation point behind this. New things have come into existence. They have been birthed in your life. Or it has become a new thing. Or he has been birthed and, okay, now exist, being one of the different kind, character, and quality. In other words, now that the Lord Jesus Christ is in us and the life we live, we live by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ is something that's new in us. And that's what we have to allow to happen. Recognize the newness of what's going on there. Okay. In other words, make it practical in your life. It's just not a verse you memorized. And yeah, it's part of the doctrine of Paul, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's, it's a reality say a reality I, I remember a number of years ago when someone told susan and i well you just people live in a spirit world you know what she was right that's where we are to live okay we are to live now let me keep moving i'm still on page one here okay i have three pages so the christian life then because of this is a high calling okay it's a high calling Let's look at some verses. Let's go. We're in Philippians, so let's notice chapter 3. All right. Chapter 3, verse 14, I believe I want. Yes, here. Paul says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Upward, the high calling. Okay. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians, please, in chapter number 1. 2 Thessalonians. Timothy. 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 1. Let's notice verse number 11. To this end also we pray for you always, that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power, so that the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in you and you in him. There it is again. Not just say him and us, but us in him. Okay. According to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, come back to Hebrews 3. All right. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3. Notice verse 1, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, as a, a premillennialist and dispensationalist, I didn't believe Hebrews was for me at all. It was for the, for the believing Israelites. But here, what kind of calling do we find in verse number 3? A heavenly calling, a high calling, see? Something that's there where we're seated, where Christ is. That's the calling. Come over to 2 Peter. All right, 2 Peter. 
please. And we'll look here also at chapter number one. Second Peter chapter one. And notice uh, verse 10. That's first Peter. Let me get to the right place. All right. First Peter, second Peter. Here we are. Second Peter chapter one, verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. A little bit of election there. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Okay. Talks about purification and that sort of thing in verse number nine. One more verse, and that's back to Ephesians chapter four. All right. Go back to Paul, see what he says here. Ephesians chapter four, notice please verse number one, Ephesians four, one. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you. What's it mean to implore somebody? You're almost begging them, see? To walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Verse four says, there is one body and one spirit just as also you were called into one hope of your calling okay so uh, it's a calling that we see so to walk as jesus did requires unwavering hang in here with me belief total trust and a yielding spirit and last week we learned that the first step was what desire you have to have a desire for this and we found that most christians and this is through my reading and, and stuff that, you know, reading other other people and uh, surveys and stuff. Most folks never get beyond step two. What's step two? Is step one, co-crucified. Step two, co-buried. And most believers don't get beyond that. Okay. Because to a lot of believers, and I'm not condemning anybody, please, because your heart goes out to folks that don't have a desire really to get in. They're, they're still stuck in a fleshly world, in other words, and, and, and they're looking for a way out of the fleshly world, and, and which isn't going to happen, not, not at all. And so what we have to do is realize not only that, but we've been raised with him. And Mr. Knock calls that, vivification we, we've been renewed to life okay and then we're co-ascended and co-seated with him and therefore as paul writes set our affections and our minds where where he is the realm of jesus okay and that's what has to get into us so it becomes just part of who we are it becomes natural all right so such a life is a it, it is is it's reachable on this earth in our human bodies. It can happen. How do you know that? Jesus did it. Who else did it? Paul did it. All right. And they are our models. Does anybody know what 1 Corinthians 11 1 says? You want to unmute yourself? We'll, we'll go over there because there's another verse in 1 Corinthians. Did you come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Okay, chapter 11 and verse number one. Watch what it says. And uh, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. So who did uh, Paul pattern his life of? After Christ. Come chapter, uh, I think chapter four. Yeah, come back to chapter four. See, brother, Dan, I've heard all this before. Well, what's it meant to you? That's what I'm asking tonight. Has it become part of your subconscious living? I think it's walk. It's to say, listen, uh, we talk about old covenant, new, new covenant, old covenant passed away there in 70 AD, but the law never passed away. Where is the law today? It's in your heart. Do you have to think about the law? No, it's there. It's part of who you are. You don't have to worry about what, you know, lying and murder and all that sort of thing. You know it's not correct because it's it's innate, it's natural now. 
with you. It's part of what the law, uh, Lord taught. But when we come to uh, chapter 4 and verse 16 uh, in 1 Corinthians, he says this, Therefore I exert, uh, exhort you, be imitators of me. That's what he says. And then in chapter 11, he says, because that's, I imitate Christ. Uh, let's see, how many of these do I want to give you? <laughs> as, as I look at it. Um, let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Okay. Let me give you one more. You find us in many places. Uh, chapter 3 of uh, Philippians, and notice verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example, Paul says, and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. So we're the, there were those that Paul wrote to, and the Philippians were one of them. Uh, notice this in verse number one of Philippians chapter one. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints, notice what it says now, in Christ Jesus. Okay, who are at Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Now you'll find this, this is interesting, you find this in, uh, uh, let's see, I wrote down, you find it in Ephesians, you find it in Colossians, and you find it in 1st, 2nd Thessalonians. You don't find it in Romans, you don't find it in 1st um, uh, Corinthians or 2nd Corinthians, okay, that, that this, is, is, this is spoken. But the idea of, of us being in him, as well as him in us, is the idea that, that the Lord taught there in uh, John chapter 15 with the vine and branches. And, uh, you know, I try to give you these little hints to keep you busy. If you go to your Bible and look up the word uh, abides, where it talks about abides in him, okay, or just abides, you'll find there's 60 references in the New Testament. And a lot of them have to do with us in him that was something that god expected but how does it come about well you have to go back and read first john chapter 2 by us walking after him because there's a negative side of that which i don't even want to get into the negative side if you neglect him you're not in him he's in you though that's why he can't deny himself there in uh second timothy chapter 2 Okay, so all this is, it's, it's very interesting, and I believe this, it's something that we shouldn't take lightly. Okay, now let me keep moving here, because I want to get to the end of this today. Uh, well, we're going to continue it next week, but, uh, so if I co-died with him, co-buried with him, okay, co-risen with him, co-ascended with him, and co-seated with him, okay, this is my identification then with Jesus Christ. And it should be a condition then of my life experience and what I am. Do you know, uh, come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. All right. Uh, we're in Philippians. Keep your hand in Philippians. I'm going to come right back there. Uh, notice this in Philippians. I am in Philippians. Oh, I sent you to Col uh, Corinthians. Okay, I got too many verses going on here. All right. First Corinthians chapter number two. This Bible has such thin pages. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, notice first Corinthians two and verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord? That he will instruct him question mark okay but we have the mind of christ we have the mind of christ remember any man is in christ what is he it's a new creation now where's that mind come to us from from the scriptures okay so when i come back to philippians now i want you to Chapter number two, first five verses say this. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, 
if there is any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude, or some Bible say mind, in yourselves, which was also in whom? Christ Jesus. So Paul brings up this word mind a number of times in these verses. Verse 2, verse 3, all right? Have this mind or this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. It was given to us. So as we read the scriptures, okay, what can we learn? Watch this. I, I don't know if any, any of you ever go to Christian Book Distributor, cbd.com. Give it a go. All right. And, and spend yourself 10 or 15 minutes there just looking at all the things that they have. Well, I, I've been a member for 40 years, and they have a religious book club, and it's it's for pastors and leaders in the church and teachers, Sunday school teachers and all that. And I, I get these uh, this, this catalog. Every month I get a, a paper catalog. It's huge, 30, 40, 50 pages. But uh, in this religious book club, uh, these are deeper studies, that, that sort of thing. But listen to this one. I, I didn't get it yet. I don't know if I will, but it sounds good. The name of the book is Gentle and Lowly by a fellow named Dane Orlan. And it's a little write-up says this. Gentle and Lowly. This is according to his own testimony. Whose own testimony? Oh, well, listen. Is Christ's very heart. What is the very heart of Christ? Gentle and lowly, low, lowly. Then in quotes, this is who he is, who Christ is. He's tender, open, welcoming, accommodating, understanding, willing. Now of all things, it says next, drawing on the finest resources in the Puritan tradition, this bestseller is written with the quiet beauty of a pastor's soul. And if a, a pastor or a leader of a church, a minister, all right, has a pastor's soul, where did it come from? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Let this attitude, let this mind be in you. All right? That's how we are to all be. Okay? We're all to be this. So, uh, <laughs> as we look at this, Preacher. I guess, yes. Gail. Oh, Gail, Gail. yes, ma'am. If you would like that book, call me later and I will treat you to it. Well, aren't you aren't you a blessing? <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Gail. We, we can do that. Well, I figured thank you maybe you need it. <laughs> okay. Anything to help the cause, you know. Praise okay. the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Now, let, let, me, let me keep going here. So, what I'm trying to say is this. When you have the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ, and those five points that, that we keep looking at, that we've known in our group for years and years. I mean, 34. Do you know that this is our 40th year of Open Bible? And we've known these points from the beginning. But have they really gotten into us? See, that's, that's the thing. So when we look at this, and, and especially Philippians chapter 2, knowing we have the mind of Christ, let that mind be in you, okay, as, as, as you see this, it allows us to operate the mind of Christ in ourselves, okay, in ourselves. So seated with him is what caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, is all about. Okay, remember, we started with First Thessalonians chapter number four, 
verses 16 and 17. This is what we've been talking about for the last two weeks. Okay. The realm of A-E-R, that's the Greek word for air, is where? It's right around us. It's what we breathe in, breathe out. It's right around us. It's not high up. That's Uranus air. Okay. Very, very important. That's the meaning, see, of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 17. Now, if you want to do your own study on it, uh, just go to the word air, and uh, there's a whole list of, you know, Old Testament, New Testament. But this A-E-R word only appears uh, seven times, five by Paul, all right, and two in the book of Revelation. And what you find, it's number 109 there. All the rest of the time in the New Testament, you see uh, air, and there's quite a few of them, it's Arrhenius. And most of the translation, I think it's only translated air like four or five times. And all the other times it's tra translated, Arrhenius, uh, uh, rather, is heaven. Okay, the idea of heaven. So that, that's, that's where it is. So let me turn over to page three, as, as Paul Harvey would say. Okay, so remember that air was synonymous with, that we've seen the last two weeks, the spirit dimension. Okay, the spirit dimension. Now, let me give you some verses here so we can see this. And a lot of this uh, we already looked at, but let's do it again. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. What? Well, we'll read the verse. Verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground. So he formed man, dust of the ground. What was he? He was a form. All right. He was just dust is all he was. You know, God put it together and uh, but he didn't call a man there. OK, he says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a what? Living being or a living soul. So so he had a, he had a man laying there, but it was nothing but dust. But what did he do? The spirit realm given to. That man made him a what? living soul or living being, depending on what Bible you're using. So it's the spirit of God. OK, spirit of God. Now, now watch this. Come to Job with me. Chapter 33, please. OK, Job chapter 33. All right. Can you hear my dog snoring? She's laying right next to me and having a good sleep here. Okay, Job 33, notice verse number four, where it says this. Okay, uh, now this is the young man, Elihu, who's claiming to be speaking for, for God. Okay, you remember the, the other three guys are set aside. Now, now the younger fellow comes in, and he says this, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. All right. So the spirit of God has made me. And the breath of the almighty gives me life. Might have been a reader of Genesis. Right. But come over to verse or chapter 34, please. And verses 14 and 15. If he should determine to do so, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together. And man would return to where? Dust. Now, I mean, you know, when you read that, okay, this is still Elihu speaking. So if God should determine to do so, if he would gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together. Okay? Just perish together. Now, we know what Ecclesiastes says. When a man, you know, dies, what happens to his spirit? goes back to God who gave it. OK, uh, the body goes to where? Goes to Hades, OK, or Sheol, the unseen place. OK, well, that I'm sorry, the body goes to the ground and then the soul goes to the Hades or, uh, uh, you know, Sheol, the un, un, um, unseen place. OK, uh, that's until a certain time frame, which we'll see here pretty soon. All right. So now one more verse. 
in this. Come to John chapter 20. So what he's trying to say here, well, what is it that gives life? It's the Spirit of God, okay? And when I come to John, uh, come on, man. Here's Matthew by John. John chapter 20, please. Okay, John chapter number 20. Notice what he says here. John 20 and verse number 22. Now this is at the Lord's resurrection and appears to the disciples. And he says this, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So actually those disciples there didn't have to wait till Pentecost. They got Pentecost was the power of the spirit, okay? But again, it, it's the Lord giving them uh, life, okay? So this is the realm where the Lord Jesus Christ resides. It's in a spiritual realm. I'm going to show you something on Sunday. Now, on Sunday, we say it's Resurrection Sunday and all that. So we're going to talk about his resurrection, but we're going to talk about the Lord's second birth. I don't know if you've ever thought of that, okay? Because the Lord was born under the old covenant. Therefore, he couldn't be letting the cat out of the bag. He couldn't be what the Messiah was to be. What was the Messiah to be, according to Zechariah? He was to be a king and a priest. But in the flesh, the Lord couldn't be a priest. So there had to be a second birth. And we'll show you that Sunday morning. It's very interesting when you see that stuff. Okay? It's really great. So, the point being this tonight, he becomes our reality. Okay. Now, you know, I'm, I believe in fulfillment theology. I used to believe in futurist theology. But let me ask you a question. Isn't this spiritual caught up more scripturally honoring and Christ glorifying than the new theory of a flight of escape through outer space? You say, why do you say new theory? Well, when did the theory of a rapture take place? I, I've shared that with you the last two weeks. With John Darby, 1830. Plymouth Brethren in, in uh, Scotland. And where did John Darby get this idea that saints are going to be taken up? The ones that are alive are going to be taken up without dying. He got it from a young lady named Margaret MacDonald. A 15-year-old girl that during a prophecy uh, a conference was in a trance and said, God's going to take up some living people, but not all of them. Well, what John Darby did after receiving, um, uh, i got to get his name again and say it correctly, the, the, uh, Francisco Rivera, the, um, friend, the Jesuit priest, who in, in 15, 1500s, about 1580, I think it was, okay, uh, what he did is he divided Daniel's 70 weeks and put a great uh, gap there, okay? He ended the 16th, uh, 69th week at the Lord's baptism, okay? And then saw in the future, he was a futurist, that sometime that 70th week would begin. We call that tribulation and all that kind of business. But what Mr. Darby did, Instead of taking it from the Lord's baptism, he took it from the, the Messiah shall be cut off. He took it from the cross and put it out 2,000 years. It might be three or 4,000 years, okay, in, in, in their eyes. That's why I call it a new theory. Because this thing of, of the catching up, okay, according to the futurists, is something that's brand new. Uh, I mentioned last week, if you remember this, I, I'm not going to harp on this or anything like that. But there's no church creed that mentions this. We say, we church creed. And remember, I told you I called my daughter because I couldn't find the Presbyterian creed online. And Jennifer works, you know, for the Presbyterians. And, and she went right to their history and said, no, Dad, there's no mention of that at all in their creed. And then I found the Lutherans don't have it. The Methodists don't have it. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the, the Lutherans, you know, they just, it's, it's not there. Nobody believed it. Okay, until when? Until Darby made it popular, and it was made popular actually in the United States, because Mr. Schofield then wrote his Bible, and he took those that idea. Uh, the um, 
Dallas Theological Seminary, Mr. Schaefer. I used to have his his volumes. I gave them to Dan, I think, of his books. He, he, he held to that, all right? Now, this was at the early 1900s, but you know what happened when Charles Swindoll became president of Dallas Theological Seminary? Here about 12, 13 years ago, he eliminated all dispensational teaching. Now, I think he's still a futurist, I, you know, but uh, it's, it's interesting as you see this, it, it's, it's something new that the people will be taken up for Thessalonians 14. So let's, let's, I'm going to read, read the passage here in a minute. Okay. So uh, as we look at this, then part of the abundant life that Jesus came to give us, John 10, 10, I'm going to give you life and give it to you more abundantly is in that spiritual realm. And uh, we're putting together, I found information on, uh, remember the verse about uh, the works I do, you'll do greater. I found some information on that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that, okay? So it, it, our life in Christ, if we can perceive this, okay, of already being raptured without leaving the ground is a victorious life. This is why, you know, and I'll give you this testimony. My brother Tim is the one who first introduced me in part to the, the, the preterist view. And he says, Dan, I, I'm free. I'm a free man now. Okay? Christ has fulfilled all. And that's how I feel now. Okay? He's fulfilled all. And what my duty, if you want to say, is to totally love him and follow after him because he died for me. I died with him. I was buried with him. Right? I was raised with him. I was ascended with him. And I'm seated with him. I'm not waiting for it. It's already happened in terms of, you know, the rapture thing. That that's, you know, which is a not even a word. Okay? So, let, let's... Let's watch this just just for a moment. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, let's go to First Thessalonians chapter four, okay? And I'm going to read uh, verses sixteen and seventeen out of uh, for time's sake because it's it's getting late. Uh, time's sake. Watch this. Let me go there. Did I mark it? Yeah. Let me read verses sixteen and seventeen. I'd like to start with 13, but I, I don't have time to go through the whole thing. It, it, it takes too long. Well, watch 16 with me. Uh, this is out of Mr. You know, Jonathan Mitchells. He says, because the Lord, Yahweh, or Christ, because the Lord himself will continue habitually descending from the atmosphere. The literal Greek rendering is continue habitually descending from the atmosphere within the midst of <laughs> a shout of command, within the midst of the chief agents, okay, messengers, their voices, and within the midst of God's trumpet, he says, and the dead people within Christ or in union with him, the anointed one, will continue raising themselves up first. So those that are dead, those that are asleep, okay? Now there's might be a difference here between those asleep and those who are dead, but that's another study, okay? Continually bringing them up. Now watch what he says in 17. Thereupon, we presently living folks, the ones presently continuing to be left around will at the same time together with them proceed being seized and snatched away within clouds. Now, if you've been with us the last two weeks, now somebody please remember this. Unmute yourself and tell me, what does clouds mean there? Anybody remember? Just one, one person. All right, Susan just said it. It's people. All right, the people. Uh, you go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse number one. Great cloud of witnesses. It's people. You see verses 22 to 24. It's people. And you're going to see that in the book of Revelation. It's people. 
you're going to see, I mean, how did God appear to Israel after he let, as he led them out of, out of Egypt? In a cloud. He was with them down here in a cloud, okay? Away within clouds, it says, okay? Into the midst of the air, A-E-R, the Greek word. That means the air just right around mankind. It's on, you know, the, the face of the earth. It's not up where the birds fly and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so, and then he has a note here, the air that we breathe in, the mist, the haze, the atmosphere around us. Note, he says, this would be in Earth's lowest atmosphere, the place where all is air, into the Lord's meeting. And thus, shall we always continue being together with the Lord. Now, the meeting. The word there is the same one used in the gospel accounts where the, about the ten virgins, five had their oil ready, the other uh, five didn't have it ready. And so when the Lord showed up, they were able to go out and meet the Lord, but the other ten couldn't do it. Okay, that was a meeting. And it has to do, and we've seen this in the past, where uh, a dignitary was coming to town. And so the town leaders would go out to meet the dignitary and bring him I'll bring him into town, okay? Now, I want you to think about that for a minute, all right? Uh, and let's go back to first, that's, uh, first Corinthians chapter 15. Now, what was written first? First Corinthians 15 or Thessalonians chapter 4? Well, we know Thessalonians was written first, okay? So when we come over here to chapter 15, we... Uh, we see the fact of Christ's resurrection. We see the order of resurrection beginning in verse number 20. Uh, here's, here's something interesting for you. Has death been abolished yet? Any opinions out there? <laughs> yes. Someone says yes. I agree with you. Notice verse 26. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Now watch this. Go to Second Timothy. This is this is uh, you don't have to pay for this one. Come to Second Timothy and uh, chapter one. Second Timothy chapter number one. Okay. Second Timothy one. Let's notice verse number ten, where it says, "But now has been revealed. Now has been revealed. Was this book written after First Corinthians fifteen? Yes, it was." We're looking a little progressive revelation here, okay? But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So according to this passage, this verse, okay, death has been abolished. You can go, I'll go compare Hebrews and, and you'll see that, okay? Now let's come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I want to read verses 35 down uh, to 54 or so. And let's just read it and see what it says here. I think this will be very eye-opening to you. Okay. Now, my contention is this. And I first learned this from Don Preston. And then I saw a, a John Noe. He's another gentleman I've been reading. Okay. I, I got a book from... Our brother Dennis, okay, Coyle, gave me a book of his, and I have three or four of his books. But he, he brings this out, that at the parousia, the coming of the Lord, came out, the dead were indeed raised up, but God didn't take out those that are living. What he did, he gave them an increased revelation of who he was, okay, in the spirit realm. Okay, so they can continue on in the ministry. You know, and I'll just say this in passing. Uh, believers and people today are so worried about the world. Can't do anything about it, can we? When you see a problem in government, when's the last time you wrote your representative or your senator? That's about all you can do, except if you vote for somebody, right? But what is the problem with the world today? Is it evil? Is it Satan going around? Because you know my stand on Satan. He's been gone for 2,000 years. 
problem with the world today is mankind. And not just unsaved mankind, it's with Christianity or believers. We are in union with God to fulfill what God wanted to have happen. So where'd you learn that? All the way back in Genesis chapter number one. What did he make man for? To take care of the earth. Okay. Not just the earth, but people around him. There's only one solution for mankind. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. And until we take, there's a movie Susan and I just watched and about, we bought a zoo. It's a really cute movie. You should, you should watch it. Mark, Mark Wahlberg. It's a true story, by the way. And he was taught by his father, son, or his, his brother, his older brother. It only takes 20 seconds of courage to change your life. And that's how he met his wife. He saw her through the window of a restaurant. He went in and tried to introduce himself. And he said to her, how could you even listen to a man like me that wants to talk to you? You know what she said to him? Well, why not? 20 seconds of courage. And they ended up getting married, had children. Bought a zoo. It was real, it's really a great story. Folks, I'm telling you this. If you can get the idea and the concept that God has given to us, the mind of Christ, and realize that we're, you know, I'm going, not going to go through those five points again. If you can realize and get it in your heart and mind, and have 20 seconds of courage, you'll be able to share what you are in Christ. Say, with somebody. So let's read this real quickly. I, I got to run. Okay, it, I'm keeping you over time. Okay, verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Now notice Paul's next statement. You fool. Exclamation point. That which you sow does not come to life unless it what? Dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which it is to be, but it bear grain, perhaps of wheat or some something else. But God gives it a body just as he wishes. And to each of the seeds a body in his own. He's talking about plants in here, right? All flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one flesh of men, another of flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthy, earthly is another. There is one glory in the, of the sun, and another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for stars different from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Different glories. Now hang in here with me. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised what? An imperishable body. So what's he talking about here? Those who have dead are dead. They were sown. They were put in the ground. Perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in what? Power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a what? What's it say there? Someday you're going to believe this. It's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There's also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. How did that happen? God breathed into him, remember? The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Jesus is life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, in other verses. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are what? Heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of what? The heavenly. And what is the heavenly? It's a spiritual body. Now watch what it says. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not, we will not all sleep. 
but we will all be what? Changed. What was the change that happened to the, the, the uh, people that were dead? They got a spiritual body. What about the ones that were alive? That's they were changed. Body. Changed how? They got the thing of the, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, okay, the ascension, and the being seated firmly into their hearts and minds, okay? So it became a subconscious thing to them, and they could walk just as the Lord walks because now they're in him. But then it says this, in a moment, a twinkle of an eye at the last trumpet for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. No, that's something. The dead will be what? What does it say there? Raised imperishable. But we that are alive will be changed. Doesn't say changed into a spiritual body. Just changed. Now, let me keep going, because I'm going too fast through this, because we can see there's a difference between imperishable, mortal, and all this kind of stuff. Now, let, let me go. Okay, verse uh, 52. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at uh, the last trump, the trump will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable. The perishable are the ones that already died, right? And this mortal must put on what? Okay. Those that are dead are not mortal. Who's mortal? Those that are alive. Do you read a verse in Romans chapter 8 that talks about God giving life to your mortal body? Chapter of Mrs. Haley just told us. Chapter 8, verse 11. But let's keep going. These are things we can look at later, okay? But when this perishable would have put on the imperishable and this mortal, notice, and this mortal, there are two things going on here. The perishable has to put on the imperishable. That's the spiritual body. Uh, go read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5. And this mortal will have put on immortality. Then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in what? Victory. You can read the rest. Second Timothy 1.10. Christ has already taken care of death. And the death he's talking about is not physical death. Men die because their bodies wear out or accidents or, or whatever. Okay? What death is he talking about? Sin death. And you and I have been raised from sin death when we got saved. So God, in his kindness and his goodness, okay, has given us the very chance to be conformed to the image of his dear son. And you know what it takes? It just takes a desire and the willingness to look in the scripture and to see, yes, I believe I was crucified. Yes, I believe I was buried. Yes, I believe I was raised with him. Yes. I believe I ascended. Yes, I believe I'm seated with him right now. And therefore, dear folks, you can live in the realm of Jesus Christ, which is a spiritual realm.